Hi, today we're talking to Danny Shapiro, author of Devotion, a memoir, as well as five best-selling novels, another memoir, and another book coming out in 2013, which we'll talk about. And Danny, thank you very much for coming oh, today. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. <laughs> today our cocktail is a caramel apple martini. I know it's a little daunting. It's a little daunting, but we're going to slosh shall all bits. Yes, I please do. All right. Please do. So that's the apple. Mm. Yeah. Okay. The smells Dangerous are just. Looking. I know. That's the. Is that the butterscotch? Yes. Butterscotch and apple. And. And that's the, the new Amsterdam vodka. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm not much of a martini shaker, but here we go. <laughs> the sound is so engaging. Yeah, it's very... Okay. It's shaken, not stirred. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. It really does smell fabulous. It does. Apple and very apple -y. Yes. Okay, yep. start with that. There we go. We won't be greedy. We can always top up. Can I, can I do a little more there? Lovely. Thank you. Okay, mm. let's see. Chin chin. Chin chin. Mm. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, that's yummy. That's totally delicious. That is absolutely you delicious. You know, that's actually really one of those dangerous drinks because it just yeah. tastes... Like a chocolate bar. Yeah. It tastes like a caramel bar. That's with delicious. With a touch of apple. Mm. Oh, oh my. This is like you could have three of these and <laughs> and not even know it. Right. <laughs> okay, mm. that's delicious, lovely. Okay, so devotion, a memoir. Um, this is this is such a contradiction. This book because it's about such sadness, but it made me laugh, mm -hmm. and I'm so curious as to how much work what the the process was that you managed to, how you managed to do that. Tell us a bit about it, how it came about. Well, the, the way the book came about, or the idea for it, I think was very much the way most of my books and most of my ideas come about, which is with kind of a crisis, uh, an, an internal crisis. And in Devotion, it was very clear. Um, I was in my mid-40s, I had just moved to the, the Connecticut um, from New York City with my family um, on the surface of things, and not even on the surface of things, really um, everything was good. Everything yes. in my life was good, but there had been, as is true of all of us, there had been sorrow, there had been some hard things. But this is more, this is much more than your, don't you feel? Yes, much more than your average, than, yeah, but so much, so much tragedy. There, there had been, yeah. the, and and I mean, and we can we can talk about yeah. that. But I think what happened was, I would go about my days, um, taking care of everything, crossing everything off every to do list, um, taking care of my son, um, doing my work, enjoying the country, um, having fun with my husband, and then I would fall asleep at night, having done everything, and 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 at three o'clock in the morning, I would wake up just as if something was startling me awake. Mm -hmm. And it was, it felt like the moment of truth. Um, when, I, when I've gone around the country talking about devotion, I will often ask an audience to raise their hands of how many people here wake up at three o'clock in the morning. And it is amazing right. to see yes. how many of us um, struggle with that feeling of uh, aloneness, you know, that middle yes. of the night sort of, but I recognized it to be a spiritual crisis. And I didn't even know what that meant because if you had asked me, I, I was from a religious background, but I didn't consider myself particularly attuned spiritually. I just... Um, but, but wouldn't you naturally... Uh, your father was um, an Orthodox Jew who, yes. who was very observant. Is that a good yes. description? So, yes. So that's... You were steeped in something that then was not there. Yes, exactly. I mean, I, I, as, as, a, as a child and as a, as a girl, I was raised with... Um, this set of rituals, you know, there, there was something to do in every situation. Yes. There was a prayer yes. for everything. Yes. There was a blessing. To make it okay. To make it okay. And my father, who I really adored, um, was uh, 
a man of ritual and mm. a man of, of deep um, observance. And, and yet at the same time, I didn't really understand what it, what it did for him. I loved how you described the steps very patiently and clearly. You didn't rush over any of those steps that, um, you know, when you're trying to keep a compelling pace in a book, you could be forgiven for wanting to rush through mm. that. But there was a, the sense of ritual to your writing, as you described. His, his, his uh, it's called laying to fill in, putting laying on to fill in. Um, every morning when he would pray, before he worked on Wall Street, and I grew up in New Jersey, and every morning before he put his suit on and boarded the train, he would pray and there was a very elaborate ritual of the laying the tefillin with a, a black leather strap that mm -hmm. had to be wrapped around a certain number of mm -hmm. times and... Um, the, and everything measured and specific. Very, very specific. Um, and I had this very strong memory of, as, as a girl of watching him. Did, and, did he seem, was his mood changed after he did that or was it just the same? I, I wondered about that because there were certainly times where I saw his mood changed, especially by communal prayer, oh. by going to synagogue. Yeah. I think that his morning prayer was um, like a meditation of sorts. I don't think he was particularly thinking about no, the words. It was the habit. It was the habit mm. and the grounding. Mm. Um, I don't know what he would have been without it. So I can't um. even, in a way... I don't even know. I just, I think that it was, he would no more have started his day without it um, than, uh, you know, flown. I mean, yeah, he just, he had, yeah. he had to do it. The one thing that crossed my mind, um, I wondered whether, did you ever think about hormonal changes, that kind of thing? Because I've read about, mm. you know, panic attacks can be imbalances in hormones that can mm. come in your mid forties. Did you ever think about that? I never did. And no. I think I didn't because it had been in me, you know, that, that panic. You recognized I it I recognized almost. it. It wasn't, oh. it wasn't something new. Oh, it see. was something that had been dormant huh. that, that began to rise to the surface. And, right. and around the same time that I started really thinking that I needed to write about it, um, I came across this quote that I, that, I, um, that I quote in Devotion from Carl Jung where he wrote, Thoroughly unprepared, we take the step into the afternoon of I life. I love that. And I, I just thought, that. afternoon of life. I mean, the, the phrase yes. just yes. struck me. But the books, books can prepare us. You know, I yes. think of the line in the Desiderata about nurturing strength of spirit. Yes. And to me, that's what books do. Yes. They prepare us and help us. Yes. Well, and when I, when I began to write Devotion, there were many books that I realized that I wanted to read. Yes. And, but the really surprising thing was I owned many of them. <laughs> In one case, Abraham Joshua Heschel's The Sabbath, I owned maybe five copies. People had kept on giving You'd it to me. Oh, okay. No, but I, people gave it to me as gifts. Or In some cases, I had bought them and they were on my bookshelves, patiently waiting for me. <laughs> but it, the kinds of books that I bought with every intention of reading them, but yes. wasn't ready or, or yes. didn't have, or was, was resistant. Yeah. And I think- But that's why we need a book club sometimes. Yeah, oh, very true. You know, yeah. To take us to somewhere that we're sort of ready for, but not quite. Yeah, I think yeah. When, when book clubs really work and when they're really about the book um, and not, not, you know, not just about getting together with friends and, you know, <laughs> well, having... I actually like that. Oh, first, that but they're kind. both. Well, they're, they're, they're <laughs> they both, can be I both. think. Yeah. So with, with book clubs, are, are you in a book club? I'm not in a book club, but I visit a lot of book clubs. And from the writer's perspective... Uh, visiting a really wonderful book club is like six months of psychoanalysis because they've all thought so deeply about <laughs> about your book and in some cases multiple books. Yeah. And I've had book clubs point out to me threads of commonality between thematically between different books of mine that I haven't really considered or thought about. It's really um, it's, it's a lot of fun and very meaningful. Yes, I know you. When you read a book that you love, what do you do with it if you're not in a book club at the moment? Oh, I share it. Just to I, friends. I, well, I, I write about it. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I review quite often for the New York Times Book Review. And okay. uh, and I only, I shouldn't say this because it sort of um, makes me really not a very good critic, but I really will only review books that I love. If I'm given a book to review that I don't love, I don't. I think that's reasonable. I don't review it because I don't, I don't, I don't see the point. No. Uh, um, there, no. There's so little space and there's so yeah. much noise. Yeah. And also, you know that the writer has worked hard, no right. matter what they came up right. with. Right. And, and who are we to, you know, 
cut out the the legs out from underneath a developing writer. Right. That's not right. Um, not 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 for me. No, not I, necessary. Yeah. 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 So um, how do you must have a lot of very demanding elements in your life in terms of actually writing yourself, mm -hmm. teaching, reviewing books. Um, how do you choose the times? How do mm -hmm. you manage it all? I love the way you just said actually writing because that is the. Um, it, that's where everything stems from, yes. and yet yeah. it it can be what falls by the wayside. And when it does, the feeling that I have is of um, getting less and less comfortable in my own skin. I can exhaust backing up. Yeah, it's just I am not well when I am not writing, and and eventually it yeah it's eventually going to be it starts bad. To, exa exactly. Um, mm -hmm. When devotion came out in two thousand and ten. Um, it was a very interesting time because it really, I wasn't sure that anyone would read this book. I thought it might be, it was so idiosyncratic to me mm -hmm. that I thought it might be, uh, you know, not Jewish enough for the Jews, too Jewish. It was for, very brave, it, you I know, thought. The, 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 it's because it has Buddhism in it, it has mm -hmm. yoga in mm -hmm. it. it. It's not a mishmash in any way. I think it's the opposite of a mishmash, but it was my own very esoteric mm. journey to try to fuse together different disparate elements, elements. Dis Absolutely. disparate elements, and so I really worried that um, that really nobody might, that it might be, uh, might be threatening in a yeah. way. Did and, you and get lashback from Very Jewish? little, very really? little. In fact, um, when I went on book tour for Devotion, I, this is when I understood that something was definitely up with this book. I, I remember going to Los Angeles, and that five days that I was in Los Angeles, I spoke to Federation, uh, the Jewish Federation, mm -hmm. to an audience of a couple of hundred women. I spoke at a yoga shala, um, at a bookstore, you know, in all the kind of usual venues, um, at a luncheon. And then uh, the Unitarian Church uh, right. invited me so to come. So everyone. And, and I, yes. I, I, I took a picture of the, the sign outside of the, this Unitarian Church in, in, in uh, downtown L.A. that said, Sermon, Danny Shapiro. <laughs> <laughs> Look so, at, wow. Right. But How amazing. Over time, I would say for 18 months, I was on the road more often than not. Uh, every week I was somewhere. Yes. And I was finding, of course, that I wasn't writing. Yes. And that, start, that balance started feeling not right at all because everything from me, and I think this is true of writers generally, that um, if I'm not writing, I don't know what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite quotes about writing is from Joan Didion, where she, she wrote, um, if I had even the remotest access to my own mind, I never would have become a writer. Yes. And so, and if I don't know what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling, I stop being very uh, able to impart anything resembling uh, wisdom or... Yes, or being present. Being, or, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, so then it becomes time to really back off and go, I, 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 I refer to it as going in and out of the cave. Okay. When I'm writing, I'm pretty much in the cave. I try very hard to stay off the internet. The internet is like crack for writers. <laughs> um, I discovered this software program called Freedom, uh, where um, I download this program, Freedom, and I click on it, and it asks me how many minutes of freedom I would like <laughs> from that the internet, you know, <laughs> and 30 minutes, an hour, two hours. And when I'm writing, I turn everything off. And do you write in an office in your house? I do. Yeah. I've done everything. I've, I've, I've written in an office outside of my house. I like writing at home these days for a few reasons. One is I have dogs, and I like being around them. Mm. If the house is empty, if anyone's in the house, it doesn't work at all. No. Dogs are no fine. Psychic. No human Privacy. being. Yes. Yes. Um, and also because I have a yoga practice, and I really like to take a break in the middle of the day, unroll my mat, do yeah. my yoga practice, go back, and, and just feel the fluidity and the freedom of being able to do that. And do you mark on your calendar, you know, from 10 to 12 writing so that you can't put any other appointments in there? Or I, I don't mark it in my calendar, but I protect my mornings. Yes. Um, I try very hard to protect my mornings. I will never uh, meet someone for breakfast or do anything at my son's school or right. anything like that. Even lunch, I, I almost never do lunch. Right. Because I, if I know that if I have that amount of time, then I will get work done. Right. You know, I don't remember who it, it was that once said, it isn't the writing, it's the sitting down to write. Mm. If, I've, 
if I have sat down, if I've made the space for it, then something it will, will happen. happen. Yes. Yeah. So is it hard to say, we were actually talking about this before you came, that even when you've embraced, you've committed to producing more work and people are expecting more work from you, it can still be hard to say no. To say no to, to uh, say no to engagements or yes, speech. charitable. Sure. You know, how do you do? The, how do you decide? It's it's an ongoing um, process. The, the the deciding, um, hmm. and and sometimes it's learning from making a mistake. Um, I recently spent a week teaching um, on the other side of the country, and um, and it was over Christmas. And I, was, I originally said yes to it because I thought, oh, this will make a wonderful vacation for right. my family. And mm -hmm. then my, my husband is editing a film, so he wasn't able to come, and so therefore my son didn't come. So I was alone over mm. Christmas teaching in this unfamiliar... And I thought, this, oh. was, this was unnecessary. But you didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know. No. And sometimes you can't know. No, um, sometimes that happens. Uh, but but it, it is, it's, it's a matter of really examining each, each opportunity and thinking... Well, what are the criteria? Will it be yes. a lot of fun? Mm -hmm. Fun is good. Mm -hmm. um, I remember a few years ago, I was with a friend in Florida, and it was right during my tour for Devotion. And I was trying to enter this mode of, I'm saying no, I'm just going to say no mm -hmm. to things. And this email came in to my inbox while I was sitting at her breakfast table, and it was inviting me to teach in Alaska. And I almost instantly reflexively wrote back, no, 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 I can't possibly. And my friend, Judy, looked at me and said, are you Alaska. out of your mind? How like, fantastic. This is where you should say yes. You're, oh. saying, you're saying no to the wrong things and yes to the wrong things. And so that was a wake-up call, and I said yes. And over Labor Day weekend that year, with my family, we went to Alaska, and I wow. taught on a retrofitted, retrofitted crabbing vessel, <laughs> like the most eccentric, <laughs> nutty in, situation in on, on, on an island off the coast of Homer, with, with um, birthing, if we, if, otters, everything, and if and, and if, if class ran over, uh, class couldn't run over because tide would come in and we would be, be marooned <laughs> and not be able to get back to the lodge. Oh, but how it's organic, how exactly, um, yes, how and, fabulous. Yeah, so t trying very hard to uh, suss out what will be the, you know, just the life experience. Because one of the wonderful, you know, writers uh, very rarely um, become wealthy from their writing. Right. Um, you know, they, they, you know, fame, you, you can walk down the street with any writer and no one will know them, you know, with virtually no exception. Which is sort of um, nice. Which is, which is yes, great. Yeah. Um, and it can be fraught and, you know, and full of rejection and indignity of all different sorts. <laughs> which is why we love it. Oh, it's fabulous. <laughs> love that. But it also allows for this opportunity for a really creative and interesting and full and rich life. I mean, I watched my son growing up with his father and myself being writers and traveling all over the world and being exposed to all these different people. Mm. And it's, I think it's very it's rich. Such, yeah, yeah exactly. very rich. That's interesting that I've always thought about reading that you can travel the world, of course, in your armchair. Right. But now you've gone from that actually traveling the world to teach. That's I have, fantastic. I have found myself yeah. hungry for experience the yeah. older that I get. I, yes, I, because that's I used what to, you remember. I didn't need to leave my armchair and I still mm -hmm. really don't. I've got a lot that, a lot that I can do from right there. Yeah. And But it's this feeling of wanting to explore and of increased curiosity. And I also think I mean, one, one of the people that I became close with while I was writing Devotion is the Buddhist teacher, Sylvia Borstein. Mm. And she's in her mid-70s and there are a few other teachers like that that I met along the way, and I thought, look, what is the secret? What is their, what makes them so alive uh, and um, just g is giving them this really sort of remarkable old age? Mm. And I think it's this curiosity, yeah, just this feeling of um, and acceptance, a lack of judgment, critical yes. judgment, because yes, it's that not closes like, everything. Well, down. it's like people getting stuck in a, you know. It, it, dressing the way they did when they were 20 or yes. with a hairstyle that's exactly yeah. what it was when I saw someone recently an older woman who had one of those bouffant things and I was like, <laughs> wow <laughs> did she really yeah oh my gosh yeah that's just amazing. the spray like wait you know yes. she was kind of fabulous but she you, she had clearly had that hairdo yes. you know for she her was sticking entire with it. life and she was sticking <laughs> with it that's right so is the increased desire to explore connected to a reduced anxiety level that's a great question and yeah absolutely and the anxiety level was reduced 
was it reduced because of the experiences you had in the learning or was it also part of actually writing the book? Mm. It's hard to tease those apart mm. because in, in, the, in the same way as I said that writing, uh, that I write in order to understand what it is that I know, I think I understood when I started this book that I had to write the book and go on the journey at the same time. It wasn't like I could have all these explorations and then sit back in my rocking chair yes. and write the book. Um, it, it, it was simultaneous. It, it was a spiritual journey with all of its fits and starts and all of its rockiness. Spiritual journeys are rocky. Yes. They're not these smooth, kind of seamless, lovely narrative arcs. They're messy. So how long did it take you to write this? It was probably my fastest book, although it felt the slowest because of um, the intensity. Mm -hmm. um, but it was about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and at a certain point as I was working on it, I realized that I couldn't live life the way that I usually do. I couldn't go into the city to get my hair cut. I couldn't, I, I, I forewent medical appointments. I mean, I really just, all I did- That was your medicine. Yes, yes. all I did was, was write the book and take care of my family mm -hmm. and do whatever came next in service of this journey. Mm -hmm. um, and a realization that I had was that I couldn't, I didn't need to travel. I mean, th this was not right. about traveling no, the world. No, this was about, about staying still. This was about yeah. staying still yeah. and that if I stayed still enough that my teachers would appear, that yes. I would recognize them, that right. they had been appearing all along in all likelihood. Right. And but this I time wasn't... you could integrate what they were telling you. Exactly, yes. exactly. Yeah. And almost as soon as I made that decision, it was like there was a shift mm. and it, and it, it began. Mm. And it was just really about having my eyes open. Mm. And do you think that um, when you teach, do you do you refer to your own works? Mm. Yeah, I, I not very often. I feel self conscious referring to my own work, but the book that I've just finished is a book about writing. Mm -hmm. So I've already found myself as I'm teaching. A student will ask a question about, say, um, betrayal in writing memoir. The question yes. of the question of a good question, uh, very good question, and one that everyone not even not just memoirs but fiction writers as well struggles mm -hmm. with and. And I'll think, well, you know what? Actually, I could answer that, or I have the perfect three pages Absolutely. that I can to use that it I now can, yes, and share it with a wider audience. Because it's audience. truly the distillation of everything that I've thought about for twenty years. Yes. So, in the case of, of of my new book, still writing, I do think that I will be using it as a teaching tool. But I think hopefully other people will use it as a teaching tool as well, because yes. it's about writing. I so that's use, coming I, out in October, that's coming out in October twenty thirteen, yes. and yes. that grew out of your blog on writing. Yes. And the blog is at dannyshapiro.com? At my website, dannyshapiro.com, and um, yes. So um, when someone came to you and said, would you write us a book based on this, that was easy for you to say yes to? Well, it was interesting. People kept assuming that I was planning the book. The book. Mm. And I would get emails from fellow writers of every stripe. I would get emails from really well-known writers and emails from beginning writers and they would always say the same thing which was thank you this is what i needed today oh, again really? and again and again really? that language again and again yes and then i started getting these emails from writers saying i hope you're doing a book or i assume you're doing a book and i had never considered doing a book the only reason why i was writing the blog was because publishing wisdom dictates yes. that writers should have blogs and when Publishing Wisdom dictated that to me a number of years earlier. I thought, what can I blog about yes. that is not going to make me want to shoot myself? <laughs> <laughs> that could be useful to you also. Yes, and it's not like you this, you know, this morning I had orange juice for breakfast yes. and I'm wearing these pajamas. You know, yes. Yes. But something that would be useful to me and to others and that would be a well that would be bottomless. A resource. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's a fabulous thing. I think it's interesting that the internet actually, even though we say computers isolate us, at the same time we can automate that which feeds us. Very much so. Yes. I mean, I think the internet at its best is the most extraordinary. It, it's, I think, you know, we are in a time of transition and so many yeah. of us, it's sort of like, I mean, I remember when I was about 20 and I was dating very much the wrong man and he um, uh, drove a Ferrari and he um, taught me how to it drive. doesn't make him wrong. No, not, not at all, not at all, no. It could have been very right, but it was very wrong. Um, but he uh, taught me how to drive a stick shift on his Ferrari, and it was wow. The he most, must have loved you. Uh, <laughs> the, but the most ridiculous thing, I guess, the reason why that just came to mind is partly because of the Apple Martini, <laughs> and partly because 
the internet can be like a 20 year old who doesn't know how to drive a stick shift with a Ferrari or, <laughs> or driving a Ferrari can be a really fantastic thing. That's brilliant. I love that. And that, and that makes that, how is it that you can write about such sad things and still be funny? Uh, I, for me, so much about writing is finding, um, one of the greatest privileges for me, um, and it's, I guess it's a spiritual act in a way, is taking what has been painful, taking what is difficult, and creating something new out of it, creating something Gaining that mastery has, over it also. Gaining mastery, yeah. um, creating order out of the chaos, yeah. um, finding a way to connect, um, otherwise it would be nothing but sad. Yes. So finding a way, I mean, when my father died when I was 23, I was aware very quickly that I needed to find a way to make his death mean something mm -hmm. more than only tragedy. And so now, and in my first memoir, Slow Motion, I, I, I write about it, and I very often will have young women uh, come up to me who have read Slow Motion and talk about how much it meant to them um, to read that part of my story. So and would he, how, how would he feel now about mm. your practice of Judaism? I, I like to think that he would um, really appreciate it. I, my, um, my son was bar mitzvah last year and, um, or earlier this year, and it was a completely eclectic bar mitzvah that I could never have imagined doing had I not written devotion. Huh. Um, because of devotion, I became friends with very many rabbis. Um, I, I spoke to a, um, a, a gathering of 150 female rabbis, and wow. quite, a, quite a lot of them, quite a few of them became my friends and were, were my friends already. And, um, and that would make him happy. I, well, he, but he, he wouldn't have believed in female rabbis. He, he might have. He might have come he might to have that. Come to it. Well, that's the thing is if you change one thing in life, you change yes. everything. Yes. If my father had lived, um, I might not have ever become a writer. I was a mess when he died. Well, you... I might have become more and more of a mess, and God knows what would have happened. Did you write before he died? I always wrote. So you were already a writer. I because was. Because when you I... exhaust your emotions in that way, yes, that's the way you keep yourself clean. It's like True. a litter box for a cat. <laughs> <laughs> we're coming up with some good metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> we might have to edit that one. <laughs> but the 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 feeling of permission to actually be a writer to say I mean I remember when I was at I Sarah, when I was yeah. at Sarah Lawrence and I was finally working on my first book and I would you know field the question you know so what do you do I'm a writer have I read anything you've written <laughs> not yet um, yes. and that that that's feeling tiresome. I've watched students go through that and I've watched friends go through that yes yeah. and that feeling of um, believing in yourself and believing that you have something to communicate um, when there's no evidence when there's no evidence yes. and um, and when it can it can feel like a just a very um, self-indulgent self-indulgent sort of, yeah. sort of yeah. narcissistic yeah. act yeah like who, who it and it but the the interesting thing and I see this with my colleagues and I see this with my students too is that it's a voice that is in the head of every writer every writer uh, no matter how successful or how beginning. So do we think that Ian McEwan, um, Doris Lessing, do we think they all have that voice I, too? I know Ian McEwan, I can't speak to Doris Lessing, but yes, absolutely. And um, I sort of it like is, that. Uh, well, uh, uh, Jennifer Egan mm -hmm. um, is one of my best friends and she won the Pulitzer last year for A Visit from the Goon Squad, great linked story, mm -hmm. novel, hybrid, you know, masterpiece, whatever it is. She used to say when she was starting to write Goon Squad, I'm just writing a short bad book. I'm writing a short bad book because <laughs> anybody, she's tricking herself. anybody she can really write a bad that. book and it'll be mercifully short. And well, she was tricking herself, but she needed to trick herself. Yes. Right. And, yeah. and that feeling yes. of, I, I mean, there's no one I know who's immune. In fact, I worry about the people who are immune mm -hmm. because confidence is very overrated for writers. Courage, courage is necessary. Confidence is confidence yes. makes the struggle to, to, to create something that is seamless and reads effortlessly on the page 
It's not because it was effortless. Mm. It's it's it it's, you made it. So. You made it so. And if you have confidence, then you feel like, well, I yes, wrote it. Yes, Here you go. Yes, it undermines the you're quality of what you're going to produce. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, what do you say to your students in the moments when they're faltering? I try to bring them back to what it, what is their subject matter, and why. I mean, what are our themes? Mm. Um, theme is a fancy word for obsession. I mm -hmm. think you know what. What is it yeah. that? What is it that you know that won't let go of us? Mm. Um, when I said that uh, every book comes out of a crisis, what I mean is really a question that I can't let go of. Right. Why is this this way? Or what would happen if? Yeah. Um, and the need to kind of un, un, to really spend time yes, with that to and grapple with that, that to and, grapple with it. Mm -hmm. And and I think when when students. Uh, are brought back to what that, that is for first them, spark. that kernel, yes, yeah. um, mm -hmm. then they really, um, the, 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 and, and also, it's easy to forget this, I think, but to, to write the book that you want to read, um, yes. that, that yes. um, it's, 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 and then a, it will always be a joy for you, no matter what happens to the right. book. Right. Yes, you'll exactly. always be glad that you did it and, and proud that you spent the time and exactly. it will be worthwhile. Exactly. Yeah. And and I think too often people who sit down to write and myself included, I, there's a moment in my new book, Still Writing, where I, where I write about this. The first time I had an assignment from the New Yorker, I couldn't write for a month because all I all that happened every day when I would sit down in front of my computer was I would sit there and I would think, I wonder if I'll have a cover line. I wonder what the illustration will be. I wonder what it will look like in New Yorker font. You forgot the original. Oh, yes. I couldn't write. I was absolutely stuck. And it wasn't until I, the way I tricked myself in that, in that case was that I started setting my alarm for four o'clock in the morning and just getting up before my mind could start churning <laughs> with all of that. But that That's feeling really of, tricky. I am writing with a capital W yes, now, yes. this is important. Well, and I am writing for the New Yorker. I mean, right. that's all in caps. That's right. in neon. But that's why second yeah. novels are, are often uh, yes. very difficult for yes. writers because that feeling of self-consciousness yes. is yeah. deadly. Yeah. So anything that I can do with my students, and I, I don't often talk about my books with them, but I do often talk about my process right. because I think it's very useful, yes. useful for them to know that I feel that way too, yes, that very everyone I know feels that way, mm -hmm. and that it demystifies yes, the, because yeah. everyone's alone in their rooms thinking I'm the only person who yes, feels who this who has way. this problem, it's yeah. easy for everyone else. Yeah. So what about, what happens in Italy? What's, what's going on? Mm. Um, seven years ago, my husband and I started a writer's conference. It's called Siren Land. Siren Land. Uh, one word, siren, like uh, the land of the sirens, right. Siren Land, and it's, in Positano at this magnificent, magnificent mm -hmm. hotel. Like many of the great things that happen in life, it did not happen by design. Uh, it was complete. It it was born at a dinner party in Connecticut. A uh, very close friend. How elegant. It was, wasn't it? It was lovely. Love in Connecticut. Yes. When we left the city, I thought, oh, nothing will happen from now on. Almost everything did good you, in my see, life you're has happened. You're a New Yorker. I don't have that right. uh, No, our, our friends all thought, oh, they're leaving. Oh, they're... That's it. To Meanwhile, the almost everything that's really good in our lives has happened in the last decade has happened entirely because of living in Connecticut. Wow. So, but we were, at, we were at a dinner party, the editor-in-chief of Travel and Leisure, who was a friend, and she had invited her favorite hotel owners in the world as she put it, to dinner. And she invited us, and I think secretly she had hatched a, mm -hmm. a plan, a but plot. Um, we just had a lovely, lovely time. We hit it off, and uh, a few days later, I got an email from Antonio Sersale, the owner of this hotel, said, ciao from Positano. I was like, ciao. <laughs> <laughs> and he invited us to bring over some writers, and that's how it began. It was the most organic. We didn't know anything about creating a writer's conference, and right. so then, um, very dear friend Hannah Tinty, who's the mm -hmm. editor of One Story magazine, yes. also a wonderful short story writer yes. and novelist. I have subscribed. I have them on my shelf. Oh, they're such a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful mm -hmm. magazine. Um, I called Hannah and said, do you want to start a writer's conference with us? And that's how it began. So with One Story and with my husband and myself, and we, it, the first year there were 10 writers. We opened it by application. We oh. opened it to applications, and the applications started pouring in. Wow. So 10 writers that first year. And then the second year we decided, well, this was so great, let's double it. Mm -hmm. So there were 20. Mm -hmm. And then the third year, there were 30. And that's where we've kept it. Okay. So 30 is small enough to be intimate and yes. for everyone to know everyone else. 
but large enough for there to be diversity and yeah, stimulation. Um, yeah, and sort yeah. of aliveness. Cross fertilization. And, and we have different writers coming and teaching every year. This this uh, year, Jim Shepard mm. and Karen Russell wow. are teaching. I always teach. Mm -hmm. um, last year it was um, Susan Orlean came and taught a mm -hmm. nonfiction, uh, creative nonfiction workshop. It's always Ron Carlson, John Burnham Schwartz, always different. Uh, writers coming in and as when guests. The, at the end of it, what what has what is the result for the writer? I really, I can say comfortably that Siren Land changes people's lives. It it just does. It's been. I mean, I can say it because I really don't feel any ownership of of it. Even though I created this conference, it doesn't feel you know. It's I don't a feel like effort. I'm boasting. It's yes. it, it's. People leave with relationships mm -hmm. um, with other writers that they continue to share their work with. They leave feeling less alone. Mm. Um, they leave feeling really inspired creatively mm. because unlike a lot of other conferences, there's nothing about publishing okay. at Sirenland. We don't invite yes. we don't invite editors. We don't yes. invite agents. It the does tagline take the shine is, off your impulses, doesn't it? Creative impulses when you're too focused on that. If you if you're focused mm. on the business and the business is important, mm -hmm. and we do have one evening where. The writers who are teaching there all speak um, about their trajectory, mm -hmm. and it's very honest because we're all so far away from home. <laughs> um, people say things that are really like not politic at all. And now, are do you very, record it? Uh, you should record no, it. No, I think maybe if it was recorded, they might not. No. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe some of the other sessions could That's be true. recorded they and could. Then sold as podcasts. That's true. That's true. That might mm. be the next step for Sireland. It was mm. poets and writers named it the number one international writers conference Did they last really? year. Wow. And this is really from like our kitchen table. Completely organic. But it, it, yeah. it but it, it comes out of for for all of us out of a real love of doing it. Right. And, and right. I think that that really shows. It's also so hard to get to Positano that by the yeah. time people get there. They've stripped away some of their defenses. <laughs> they're exhausted. They're exhausted, and then they're, <laughs> they're jet, -lagged, jet lagged. And the next morning, they have to go to a workshop, and there's laughter and there's tears all week long. There are yeah. tears when they arrive because they're just vulnerable and exhausted. There are tears when they leave because they don't want to leave. Oh. And and we've just really established a wonderful community. What a great service! What a great offering! It's, yeah. it's great. Yeah. Well, I thank you very much for coming today. I know how many calls there are on your time. Oh, it's so, so my pleasure. Thank you for asking thank me. Thank you very much. And thanks for watching. Bye-bye.